I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of November 1st. Hope everyone had a nice Halloween. Um, we have uh, one substantive agenda item today. We have um, a lower health ACO review. We'll have a staff introduction by Michelle Sawyer, our health policy project director, and then we'll have a presentation um, by the lower health um, compliance officer and executive director. So uh, first we'll start with uh, the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so first start with some public comment periods that are open. Um, I uh, ask you to look at our uh, Green Mountain Care Board website under public comments. There are several listed there right now. Um, the lower health uh, budget uh, open public comment period is on the website as well as um, One Care Vermont. So please take a look at those. Um, and look at the dates that we want to have the public comments in in order to be uh, put before the board before we make a decision. Um, I also um, wanted to remind everyone that we have an ongoing public comment period regarding a next potential model with the federal government. Um, any of the comments we receive, we share those with our colleagues over at AHS, Agency of Human Services, as they are leading the negotiations on the model. Um, and we, last but not least is we have an open public comment period for the community engagement work that um, the board is doing regarding Act 167 and hospital sustainability. So there's a link to add a public comment um, for anyone who may not or in addition to attending uh, my next uh, announcement regarding uh, community engagement work that the board is doing. Um, we were asked by the legislature in 2022 to provide a very thorough community engagement process to understand the current landscape of healthcare in Vermont. It is going really well. It started about two weeks ago. Um, there are nearly 40 meetings um, scheduled. There's about uh, we're about maybe two, a third of the way in. I'm happy to report that the response from community members and providers throughout Vermont has been very robust. So I just wanna encourage those on the line who live in Vermont um, to check out a meeting um, either in your community or statewide. All of these meetings are vir virtual for the first part of our community engagement. Um, and it's very simple to uh, find out when a meeting is in your area, as well as how to register and sign up and attend those meetings. So thank you all for um, getting the word out. I'm, I'm really thrilled at the response and we're very happy to hear everyone's voice in this process. So that is all I have to comment and report out on for today. I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Great, thank you. Uh, we had a meeting last, uh, is October 27th. Have the board members had a chance to review those meeting minutes? And is there a motion to approve? So moved. And I'll second it. Is there any uh, board discussion? All right, all those in favor of approving the minutes from October 27th, please say aye. 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 Aye, and the minutes are approved. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Michelle Sawyer. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I'm Michelle Sawyer, Health Policy Project Director with the board. Um, I'm here to introduce Lower Health ACO. This is the second year they have come before their board to present their budget as 2024 will be their second year in our state. All right, Thank so you. let's. Go I'm ahead, sorry. Michelle. I'm sorry. Go ahead. OK. Let's look at this chart briefly to orient ourselves in the regulatory process as it pertains to lower health. Um, on the left, we have ACOs that accept payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance payers. Um, you can see that both certification and budget review are required of these ACOs. And on the right, we have ACOs that only accept payments from Medicare. 
Um, because Lore Health is a Medicare only ACO, they are not subject to the certification process and are only going through the budget review. Uh, Lore Health does have fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in Vermont. So the review is based upon the standards and processes that the board deems appropriate, whereas larger ACOs would be subject to all standards and processes established by Rule 5. Um, and finally, as is highlighted in the bottom green box, the Green Mountain Care Board has developed Medicare only guidance for these types of ACOs with fewer than 10,000 lives. And this guidance is the basis for the review. This slide outlines the budget review process as outlined in statute and rule. Um, in deciding whether to approve or modify the proposed budget of an ACO projected to have fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in Vermont during the budget year, the board will take into consideration any benchmarks established under Section 5.402 of this rule. Um, and at this time, there were not any benchmarks set for the Medicare only guidance. Um, second, those criteria listed in 18 VSA 9382B1 that the board deems appropriate to the ACO side and size and scope, which we will discuss shortly. Um, three, the elements of the ACO's payer specific programs and any applicable uh, requirements of 18 VSA 9551 or the Vermont All Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement between the state of Vermont and CMS and for any other issues at the discretion of the board. So the staff recommend that board consider the following factors from 18 VSA 9382 um, when reviewing Lower Health's ACO budget. Uh, information regarding utilization of healthcare services delivered by healthcare providers participating in the ACO and the effect of care models on appropriate utilization, including the provision of innovative services the character, competence, fiscal responsibility, and soundness of the ACO and its principles, any reports from professional review organizations, the ACO's efforts to prevent duplication of high quality services being provided efficiently and effectively by existing community-based providers in the same geographic area, as well as the integration of efforts with the Blueprint for Health and its regional care collaboratives. Um, we also recommend um, that the board consider public comment on all aspects of the ACO's costs and use and on the ACO's proposed budget. Information gathered from meetings with the ACO to review and discuss its proposed budget for the forthcoming year, fiscal year. Information on the ACO's administrative costs as defined by the board. The extent to which the ACO makes its cost transparent and easy to understand so that patients are aware of the costs of healthcare services they receive and the extent to which the ACO provides resources to primary care practices to ensure that care coordination and community services, such as mental health and substance use disorder counseling that are provided by the community health teams are available to patients without imposing unreasonable burdens on primary care providers or on ACO member organizations. These factors were chosen based upon the size and scope of Lore Health. Um, they do have a limited presence in Vermont and they have a single network participant um, and a, a small number of Vermont lives attributed to the ACO. Um, this slide is a reminder of the timeline for Lore Health's FY24 budget review. So today we are having the ACO's budget hearing. Later this month, the Green Mountain Care Board staff will present their analysis of Lore Health's budget uh, submission to the board and include any recommendations at this time. And there is a potential vote scheduled for December 6th. And as always, uh, the board welcomes comments from the public on their proceedings. The deadlines listed here allow the board to consider public comment ahead of each upcoming event on the timeline. Um, first, public comment can be submitted by Wednesday, November 15th to be considered ahead of the staff analysis. Uh, or second, public comment can be submitted by Friday, December 1st to be considered ahead of the board potential vote. And this is the agenda for today. We just uh, reviewed the board's authority and criteria. I'll hand it over to Lore um, to go through their presentation. There will be time for questions from board and potentially staff, um, time for healthcare advocate questions and public comment. And if necessary, there is uh, the opportunity for an executive session. So I will hand it back to you, Mr. Chair, and I will pull up slides for Lore Health.
Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to have our attorney, Mr. McCracken, swear in uh, the folks who will be testifying today for Lore. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Foster. Um, Mr. Atala, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bryce, sorry. Um, are you the only two who will be uh, testifying for Laura today, I believe? Yeah, we have we do have outside counsel, um, Andrew Choi, but he may not need to swear on. Um, typically, we wouldn't swear in outside counsel unless he's providing substantive uh, testimony. Um, uh, so if you two would uh, both raise your right hands, I'll go ahead and swear you in. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause no under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. <laughs> I do. Great. Um, thanks very much. And we will turn the uh, presentation over to you. Thank you, Mr. McCracken, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Ms. Sawyer. Thank you for that uh, introduction and overview. So I'm uh, Mark Reesocker. I'm a primary care provider and the executive Director of Lore Health ACO, and it's it's a real pleasure to be back uh, with the Green Mountain Care Board uh, for a second year. Um, we've had a really good start to uh, the 2023 performance year. We've got such a great partnership with North Star Health down in Springfield. Um, we were able to spend some time with the team there earlier this year, and I, I would say it was the first opportunity I had, had to come to Vermont, and um, and it was a, a lovely visit and such a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, place to to come and spend a, a, a long week together. So um, we've also had the pleasure of uh, through the year working with other community partners um, have been able to uh, partner with some skilled nursing facilities to expand our program uh, for 2024 and have had some very good, uh, fruitful and uh, encouraging conversations with one of the local uh, area agencies on aging uh, in, in the Springfield and Brattleboro areas. And, and so we're looking forward to our budget review today. Um, uh, with that, I wanna introduce Mr. Uh, Mark Atala and he is going to lead that review. So over to you, Mark. Thanks so much, Mark. And Michelle, uh, next slide. So in terms of agenda items, we wanted to go through um, really three three main topics. So uh, just to reorient everyone to really the Medicare SSP program uh, quickly, uh, have, I'm certainly happy to answer questions there, uh, talk through uh, us and lower health and the ACO, um, and we experience our timeline uh, just to to uh, to clarify uh, what we receive and and when, and then uh, and then go through our um, Medicare only uh, budget submission for 2024. Uh, and then certainly happy to to answer questions here um, or in executive session if deemed appropriate by the board. So the next slide at, at the highest level. I mean, the Medicare uh, Shared Savings Program was, was established in 2010 through statute uh, in, the, in the ACA, uh, and it really has the, the the intent to promote accountability for the fee-for-service Medicare population. And so, uh, you know, prior to uh, both whether it's the CMS Innovation Center or uh, which you have an all-payer model uh, through, uh, or the authority granted in the statute, uh, Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. Uh, Really sought care how they how they how they did, and it was really up to those providers uh, to ensure that um, patients were uh, cared for and coordinated. Um, and so, through the shared savings program, Medicare is attempting to to really formalize that accountability through an accountable care organization uh, to coordinate items and services really under Parts A and B. So Part D is not, uh, which is uh, drugs. Um, is not included, uh, and then also ensure that there's some longer term sustainability through infrastructure uh, and hopefully redesigned care processes. So hopefully fully aligned with uh, the GMCB's uh, mission uh, and aim. Um, that was the statutory creation. Uh, the federal regulations are under um, CFR uh, Part 425, and so th there's a, a suite of things that 
really all ACOs must comply with there. And that's um, that's really the the the, the, the really what, what establishes what uh, a Medicare SSP ACO follows. Um, with that, uh, as noted in both the regulations and then elsewhere, uh, SSP ACOs must comply with all applicable laws, uh, federal criminal law, false claims act, anti-kickback statute, uh, CMP law, and then physician self-referral law. Um, and so, given that the program is over around a, over a decade old, um, the, the 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 program is delivering savings both for uh, the trust funds and then really federal taxpayers. And so uh, last year, and pretty consistent uh, with previous performance years, overall saved around one point eight billion dollars um, for the for the Medicare trust funds. Next slide, please. And so for how um, how does a uh, how does CMS manage uh, an ACO? So first, there's an annual application cycle. We do go through the application cycle every year. Um, there's different questions that are asked uh, really for a first initial applicant versus um, what we can change um, uh, annually. And so uh, the first review is really for what we went through last year. I think the last time we met, we had not actually gotten approval, um, and since then we've uh, we have gotten approval, so we're 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 live for 2023. Um, and so uh, that is a five-year agreement period, uh, and we're in the enhanced track of the shared savings program. Um, and so, as part of any shared, shared savings program in ACO, uh, CMS requires that you know we establish a shared governance, um, and so that shared governance is. Uh, predominantly led by the ACO participants themselves. So they control 75% of our governing body. Uh, and then um, in, in, in the case that there's a an ACO and, and a two-sided risk track, so both up and downside risk, which we are, uh, Medicare SSB ACOs have to establish a repayment mechanism uh, before even getting a, a participation agreement from CMS. And, and we have done that. Uh, and CMS sets what that uh, financial um, guarantee or that repayment mechanism is. It's either surety bond, letter of credit, or dollars in escrow, uh, and they uh, CMS tells the ACO what um, what that amount is annually um, there. And so, as an ACO uh, participating both now and then um, in 2024, we we we've satisfied satisfied really all of these federal requirements that we've outlined. Okay, so moving on really to our participation in Vermont. So we have one ACO participant. In Vermont, and so the the term ACR participant, uh, it's the it's a term CMS uses. So the shared savings program operates at a, a tax ID level, so a TIN level, and so all providers that bill Medicare under that TIN, uh, and that are considered part of that ACR participant. And so as part of that, um, there's around 3,800 Medicare fee for service uh, beneficiaries that are attributed to that uh, that TIN, and so that ACR participant. Uh, two of the providers uh, at that uh, at our ACR participant. Are part of the ACO's governing body. Um, what that really entails is that they have a fiduciary duty to the ACO, uh, including really the responsibility for oversight and strategic direction uh, of the ACO, and then holding uh, ACO leadership and management accountable uh, that the ACO accomplishes the goals uh, set up um, by CMS. Um, I'm sure there's a question. No. Um, and then one question that uh, I think we received was, was a little bit more detail on um, the our participant in Vermont and their uh, commitment to lifestyle medicine. So our Vermont uh, participant has actually two boarded diplomats of lifestyle medicine through uh, the College of Lifestyle Medicine and the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, and so how they how they really uh, work to promote lifestyle medicine is they have both a consultative model where there's one on one appointments with them. Uh, share medical appointments with a broader group of patients, and then uh, classes um, that people can people can join. And then, secondly, really a, a distributive model where they're training other providers on the core pillars of lifestyle medicine. Uh, and those providers, uh, while they may not want to go down the path of getting boarded, uh, they're they're still exposed to what uh, the core pillars of lifestyle medicine are. And and Mark, Dr. Bruce is actually at. Uh, the annual conference now, uh, so we had the pleasure of meeting a few people from Vermont uh, there. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, uh, was there one before this? 
Now you're good. Thanks. So in terms of our experience with SSP and, and to think through um, our timeline for budget reviews, we just wanted to, to give a little bit of uh, what do we receive and, and how does that work? So, um, so January 2023 is when we, we started our agreement with CMS. Um, we get a set of data every month that, that really is claims, uh, claims information. And so that's, that's one thing we process. But really the, the, the crux of what we receive is uh, is done quarterly. And so quarterly, we receive a set of reports that says, um, here's the beneficiaries that are attributed to you. And so we've elected as an ACO um, to make sure that the beneficiaries that are part of the ACO are actually receiving care from our ACO participants. And so what that looks like is we get an initial list of beneficiaries uh, who are receiving the plurality of their primary care from, uh, from uh, our ACO participants, in this case, our Vermont ACO participant, um, at, and that that changes over time. Those beneficiaries can be added; they can be removed, and so we receive that really every quarter. Uh, and then with those quarterly reports, we also receive for that that full set of new, you know, really the the new set of beneficiaries. Again, some most of which are old, or have been uh, attributed to us previously. Some of which are new. Uh, a sense of what their what their actual expenditures were for that that previous twelve months, and so that previous twelve months starts rolling. And so you know, as you can imagine. Given claims lag and other pieces that you know, for sure you see in other parts of um, your regulatory experience, uh, you know, there we receive really reports starting around April for 2023, and then uh, end uh, actually after the performance year. And so, uh, just from a understanding, you know, what do we, you know, what do we have as of today? Even we really have data through um, from these quarterly reports, really through uh, through June, and so. Uh, we're hopeful for more data this month, but that's just the general cycle to, to, to frame uh, for the board. Um, next year, we'll submit uh, quality data to CMS. Um, so CMS has a set of, uh, we are a, uh, as part of an advanced uh, alternative payment model, uh, we are actually a qualified, uh, our, our providers have hit a qualifying participant status in the QPP program, and so they're exempt from MIPS, but they, uh, the ACO reports quality metrics on their behalf. And so as part of that, we'll submit our 2023 data at the beginning of next year um, uh, based on CMS requirements um, there. Then we expect for the 2023 year, um, so risk scores are not final until generally uh, the very end of Q2. And so CMS uh, will give us our um, our ACO results, both for quality and cost, in 2020, uh, around around July or, or August of, of 2024. And so that's the general timeline that we uh, that we operate under, and hopefully that provides some some good color for the board of um, you know why we either do or don't have certain certain questions that you may may be thinking about. Okay, so next slide, please. It's similar to what we shared last year, so um, so shared governance. So we have uh, seventy five percent of our, our our voting is, is held by ACO participants. Twenty five percent is by beneficiaries, uh, consumer advocates, or the ACO leadership. Um, for how we are assigned beneficiaries, so again, it's it's because those patients, those beneficiaries, are getting care from a specific tin. That care is, is they're getting the most of their primary care from that tin. Or they've chosen to voluntarily align themselves with a ten or a provider, um, and that that changes quarterly. So um, we'll receive a final list actually after the year, but um, you know we we're, we're caring for everyone that uh, we're we're currently aware is part of the ACO. Um, for 2024, we are adding a new waiver, um, and so we haven't CMS has not given final approval on this. They'll do that at the end of uh, their second phase of applications. The SNFs themselves um, have been approved, um, and so but we have two SNFs in Rutland, and so they've. Um, uh, if we do have uh, waiver approval, uh, they'll be our our skilled nursing facility affiliates um, for the skilled nursing facility three day rule, which allows patients to uh, not um, to, to have access to the Medicare benefit for a skilled nursing facility without having a three day stay, uh, three day inpatient stay. Um, for our risk model, we're part of the enhanced track as I mentioned. And then our, we have a we've established a minimum savings or loss rate of half a percent. That's consistent with, with last year. And then 
this last slide. So the, the way that we think through our our general financials um, and, and happy to work through this with, with everybody. So uh, in Vermont, we'll, we'll, we expect this to be around 3,800 beneficiaries. Um, as we annualize that, it's not purely 12 months people pass away. So we, we use a little bit of a, a factor there, but you can think about it as 12 months. So we, we tie that into uh, essentially um, you know, member months. And so it's about 44,000. Um, when we go through where our patients are and their expected costs plus expected um, trend increases from CMS uh, for 2024, um, we're expecting around uh, $9,900 uh, benchmark per person annually. And so our, our expectation in terms of in terms of benchmark, and so I, this may be a little bit of a change from um, uh, you know, how to think about it. It, it, it. So CMS will set really the benchmark to say, um, you know, what, what should your expenditure have been uh, for 2024? And that, that's our assumption on, on benchmark. Um, and so then from there, we will either achieve some savings or some losses. Um, certainly, we, we, we don't know where that will head. Uh, and then the way that we'll either pay money or, or receive money from CMS if we receive savings, so it'll be the percent of shared savings. Um, so that'll be a TBD in 2024. Um, uh, times our benchmark, so if the benchmark is 36 billion, 36.5 million, it'll be the shared savings percent times that. We'll also have a quality performance score, and then CMS keeps 25% and they share 75% uh, with the ACO. And so the ACO uh, in the current enhanced track doesn't receive all the savings CMS. Uh, keeps the portion. If there's losses, a uh, very similar formula, but um, based on the quality performance score, the, the ACO you know, may only pay 40% of those losses and, and there's caps there. Um, just to, and to give you a little bit of a sense of 2022 results, um, there's about 480 ACOs in 2022, as I mentioned earlier, than, you know, 101.8 billion. Of those ACOs, I think the, the average savings was around 3.8%. And um, for the ACOs that had savings, it's about 4.8%. So the majority of ACOs, I think it's around 85% uh, achieve savings. Um, so just in terms of the model, it, it's, it seems to be successful in driving improved utilization broadly. Happy to answer questions and um have a dialogue great thank you both um miss sawyer did you have any questions that you want to start with or did you just want the board to go first um i do have a few questions if you don't mind chair please. Please, great please. um we had sent lore health a series of um questions in response to their budget submission. And there were just a couple that I was hoping to get a little bit more clarification on. Um, around, we had sent um, a list of quality metrics. It was in Appendix D, um, which for the public, the guidance is available on our website if you wish to reference it. Um, and we had asked Laura Health um, for their feedback about the feasibility of potentially reporting on those metrics. And you all had responded by recommending um, aligning our reporting with that of CMS, which we understand. Um, however, we were curious about if you were to, if it was to be requested by the Green Mountain Care Board, does the ACO have the ability to report um, the Vermont specific uh, results for any or all of those metrics in Appendix D? Um, given what the date, whatever CMS is sending to you as far as data goes, um, we're curious about hearing what steps would be necessary in order for Lore Health to be able to report those performance on those metrics. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so, so I think, I think the, if I, just to repeat back the question, you're, you're, you want, it's helpful to know, you know, CMS already providing us with that information. Can we then parse it out specifically to Vermont? Uh, or would, would it be a set of administrative uh, analytics, et cetera, um, from data and uh, that we that we have to pull from? Is that is that fair? Correct. 
I think it would yeah. be helpful to know how much of both a burden it potentially could be, or if it is not a huge, you know, or, lift for you all. Yeah, we, we so, totally appreciate the question. So we, we, if, 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 if we had received this data from CMS and um, we certainly receive a lot of data, it's not data that I'm aware that we receive. It. Um, and so we, we can do analytics to get to uh, uh, the metrics that you've requested, um, especially around, you know, the, 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 the ambulatory um, sensitive emissions. And so we're, I think we're, we're certainly able to to do that through analytics. Um, it may be, require us to uh, to hire um, you know an outside contractor to to help us get there, but uh, we're certainly able to. If it's the board request that we're, we'd, we'd like to to meet your request, but it, it's not data that I'm aware that we received from CMS today. Okay, so potentially what they send you after the end of the program year might allow for that data to be analyzed and I, I don't think so so i think okay. what we received from cms really is um claims data and we receive data that um shows us our utilization um there's not a breakdown of you know potentially avoidable emissions by hypertension like by all the disease states mentioned um okay. that being said it's there are areas that we've looked at and so we, we you know we 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 feel like we we can get you the information. It just it, it it's not data that, that shows uh, up directly from CMS that we could you know say this is Vermont section and then you know, here's what that looks like. But um, okay, I but I think we we could get there if, if it's something that the board really is tracking. It would just cost us dollars and time. I think maybe Ms. Sawyer, what I would add is we we are just to maybe reinforce what Mark. Mark said was that I, we'd be interested in receiving what, what the measures are that you're interested in and then having a conversation about what's possible and, and, and really focusing on what is, what's the objective or the goal of, of that information and what insights are you looking for? Um, because um, that request might be the best way to provide that. And maybe there's another view or another analysis of performance that would also answer that question. So we would we would be open to having that conversation. Sure, great. Thank you. Oh, that's very helpful insight. Great. Um, I also I had a question about just your your model of care. Um, I was curious if you could speak to how much care coordination plays a role in your model, um, and if it if it is a pillar uh, of lower health, is there a way that your ACO promotes its practice and its network of providers? Um, and, and if it is, do you track rates of care coordination in any way? Mark, do you sure. want me to take that? Sure, Mark. Oh, happy to come behind. Yeah, so the um, we do provide um, a report to each of our ACO participant groups um, that gives them information on which beneficiaries are have been in the hospital, which have been in the emergency department, what conditions they have, what medications they are on. And and then um, we meet with each of our, our we meet with our, our North Star Health every two weeks to have it, it's essentially a you know a operations coordination call and uh, we present the information to them. And um, given the, the, the claims, the data leg that, that Mr. Atala shared earlier, this is a process that, it, that has just started up. Um, and we've had our, we had our first call and it was well received. Uh, with respect to, do we track coordination events? Um, no, we don't do that. Um, uh, we do, we, 100% agree with, uh, and and we are we are always curious about. We, are, we agree with the idea, and we are curious about how uh, and understand what are the care management functions and capability of each of our partners. And uh, in fact, you know, when I was in Springfield, I had a chance to meet with that team um, when uh, earlier this year, and uh, I can tell you that they, it's something that's really important to each of our partners as well. But we don't actually track those events 
the I would say the ultimate outcome that we are looking for is better health of, of Vermont Medicare beneficiaries, uh, better understanding of when to access the, the right care at the right time, and um, and ideally over time we will see a decrease utilization of the emergency department and a decrease in primary acute admissions. Um, that's how we'll know if all the care coordination that's both happening at the partner level and then the uh, and then our work in terms of uh, supporting them with with data and actionable uh, things to actions to take is making a difference. Just just one one additional point too. So um, as we mentioned with the two skilled nursing facilities, we're we're hopefully bringing online if CMS approves our application. So we'll we'll have um, you know uh, kickoff and coordination calls there to say you know here this waiver is now available. Uh, for this set of beneficiaries, and so what um, our, our hope there is that we work with discharge planners uh, or emergency room, uh, or even before that, uh, to make sure that that people are aware that you don't need an inpatient stay, you don't need to stay for three days. Uh, to to if you do if you do need the, the additional level of care that a, a skilled nursing facility could provide, so I think that's the the other piece. So we you know we certainly track uh, that that is data that CMS. Uh, provides us you know, uh, essentially over the last year, how many times has, has Market Hall been in the ER? How many times have I um, had an inpatient admission? Then where am I, uh, you know, what home health agencies am I using? What skilled nursing facilities am I using? And and such. So that, that we're hopeful that that's uh, uh, an impactful uh, addition for 2024. And Michelle, does that help answer? It does. Thank you both. And I, I have no further questions. I'll hand it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'll open it up to the board members for any questions or comments they may have. Member Lunge, I see you unmuted. Yes, Dr. I have Norman. a couple, but but I was uh, waiting to see if Dave wanted to go first. <laughs> I think I, I, it was I close, but I'm going to call it. I'm going to call right. in favor of Member Lunge. I think she was first. Okay. It was close. It was close, Dave. Well, thank you. I'm quick on the unmute button, I guess. Um, hi, all. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I had a couple questions about the three day SNF waiver and what you're You've mentioned a little bit about what you're thinking about in terms of um, implementation. Um, I was curious how slash why you picked two sniffs in Rutland, which is an hour and over a mountain range from Springfield. So I was just curious about the, that choice and how usable uh, that would be given sort of the geography here. Yeah, um, I mean, I thank you for the question, Ms. Lunch and the one of the requirements of uh, skilled nursing facilities to participate in the waiver is they have to be rated at three star or higher. So it's we start with that list. Um, and um, I mean, in the ideal world, every SNF would be a three, four or five star SNF and we would be able to have a broader coverage. Um, when when we were when we realized what the options were, oh, and then of course we we reached out to all to to all the skilled nursing facilities and got great assistance from North Star Health in making introductions. There were, there also was varying levels of interest in participating, so that that decreases it as well. In the end, we you know the decision point was, do we go ahead and get started, even though it's not the ideal? So that we can learn and um, and we can get the right operational processes in place, um, or do we wait a year? And we we obviously decided let's just let's just go forward and learn. And um, and uh, an objective for 2024 is to continue to have conversations with other skilled nursing facilities, and then we'll we we'll actually be able to show them that we do have some who have already started, so they won't have that. I'm not sure if I want to go first or not type of, of decision point, and um, and then we can expand it. And I hope to report back to you in a year's time that we now have even more skilled nursing facilities joining. 
And if, and if we can make a plug, I mean, the there's not a change. And so in terms of, of what the waiver means, it, it, it means that the, when they submit their claim to Medicare, they essentially add a, a payment modifier that says, uh, you know, we understand that this patient doesn't have a three-day you know, qualifying stay, but but they're part of the ACO we've checked. There's a whole set of things that, you know, needs to verify that the person, you know, deserves or needs a sniff care, et cetera, and that it's appropriate for them. And so I think from that end, um, in this case, we're, we're, you know, part of it was partnership with, with Northstar, and it, it's, it's part of that clear coordination of, of where do they already know some of their patients live, um, and then, you know, where it may care be tougher to get to. And so if you can avoid an ER visit and go straight to a sniff that's near, nearby, um, you know, that may be an ideal scenario for some for some patients. Uh, but it, certainly, we're, we'd welcome other other field nursing facilities that um, want, want, want access to the waiver uh, to, to reach out to us. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering if you could provide a little uh, some examples about the in-kind incentives that you offer to beneficiaries, just to give us like a sense of what kinds of, um, what types of things are we talking about here? Sure, we'd be happy to do that. The, um, so the in-kind incentives that we offer are the types of things that, that uh, just help people understand how how they're doing on their own personal health journey. And they, they so um, there's a couple of home-based tests. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one example. So, so chronic kidney disease is a, uh, it's a, a really important health topic. Um, it is, it is it's not, it's underdiagnosed. So a lot of people walk around with the early stages of chronic kidney disease, but they don't feel sick. They feel just fine. And they don't even know that their kidneys have started to, to not work as well as they should. So we offer a home-based test that where they can administer itself. Um, it's an FDA approved test. Uh, we have a great partner that provides that. And, um, and they then can uh, they then can find out themselves and if it's normal they know right away if it's abnormal or highly abnormal which are the three results that the test provides to them they are then encouraged to uh, through through the app to go ahead and reach out to their primary care provider we uh, we get a report of the results and um, and if we have permission from the patient to contact their providers, we always check that from a privacy perspective. When we get the result, we then reach out to Northstar uh, and let them know that one of their patients had an abnormal result. Um, to your today, almost 50% of our Medicare beneficiaries who have done this test have had an abnormal result. And 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 I, I just got to say, this is just so it's just even if we have one person this year who understood that they have kidney disease and got in with their clinical team and got on the right therapies that can prevent the progression of disease. Um, and even maybe this was their moment to say, I'm going to change my lifestyle and I'm going to start walking more and I'm going to eat a little bit better. Um, I'm going to think about my sleep. I'm going to think about and work on the so that I have a normal, healthy amount of stress in my life. If this was the event that made that happen, then we have we have accomplished so much uh, in that moment. So that's that's one example of that uh, yeah. of the in kind incentives. And, and just broadly, um, you know, the in kind incentive, just a, as a, a reminder, it, it, for us, it, it has to be something that's not covered under Medicare. So if it's something that's a covered benefit, um, we can't offer it as an in kind incentive. So um, there are items that are related to the person's health, um, and then uh, again, not not covered. So I, if the board chooses an executive session, we're happy to uh, uh, you know offer additional detail if desired. Um, I have a bit of a technical question, so I'll ask it and you can let me know if it's too technical, but I was curious about the CMS HCC risk adjustment. 
and whether you're, you know, what you think about that methodology and if you're finding that risk adjustment methodology to be representative of the population. Um, I think there's been some criticism of that methodology in areas with access issues, for example. So I was curious if you've dug into that to see if uh, that methodology in the shared savings program is working for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll offer you probably a, maybe a different answer than um, what you'd initially hoped for. Uh, so, so they proposed actually a new model for 2024. Uh, they're phasing that model in uh, over three years in, in Medicare Advantage. Uh, it's in a proposed rule for for this year. Uh, that has not that rule has not been final finalized. So uh, we're actually not sure which um, you know which approach uh, CMS will take in terms of HCC scores and HCC just for others uh, the public that uh, hierarchical condition categories. So the way to uh, to try to 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 take into account the conditions that a person um, a provider that the person has to to their spending, and so you know there'll be a standard spend, and then multiply by the risk score to, to give what you know what their spend should be for the year. Um, and so I think from you know we generally I think criticisms of, of the HTC scores is that they they work very well around the middle, uh, and they don't work very well on the on the two tails. I think the th considerations to think through um, you know broadly, and I wouldn't give anything um, is. Some providers, so for example, an FQHC doesn't bill uh, a, a Part B claim; they bill a Part A claim, and so they may be less um, adept at submitting diagnosis claims because a Part B claim uh, is, it, you know, captures uh, I think up to ten HCCs. The H, in the case of an FQHC, they may their payment may not be different, and um, or payments are different either. In either case, the way they submit the claim doesn't really lend itself to Submitting HCCs, and so it, you can read into that. You know, would would you find some providers potentially the the record that they've submitted doesn't match what the actual acuity of the patient is, which means that it, that in theory the patient, you know, the us as an ACO looks potentially worse than than the reality. And so, um, you know, I think those are all those are all parts that um, that could exist. I you know, I think the way that we think about it is we're not. We're not the provider, and so unfortunately, you know, we're not able to um, to code. And so I think we very supportive of a complete medical record, an accurate medical record. I think the model itself, um, you know, we'd reserve judgment and leave that to uh, the health economists at CMS uh, uh, and and a lot of others in the, in the industry to to get to a pine on. I, I don't think our model is. Um, we're living in the model, so we, we're we're we're. we're if it works, it's great. If it doesn't work, uh, we don't. We don't. We we we, we can't request the change. So yeah, uh, yeah, not really in our course. control. Uh, does that hopefully that gave you maybe yes, more than thank you. Nope, okay. that's great. Um, I think that's all I have for now. I I may have lost one question, but I'll turn it over to Dave and I'll let you know if I'm found anything else. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to sort of expand a little bit on the. SNF engagement, you mentioned in the opening remarks that you were partnering with skilled nursing facilities. Is this partnership in relation to the three day waiver? Is that are there are there other layers of the partnership? It, that it is in relation to the three day waiver. Um, it, there are parts of that that uh, part of the regulation where th there's there are some operational things that we uh, will work on um, focus on obviously on coordination and knowledge of who which beneficiaries are in their ACO and then and then there's some other just some standards to meet in terms of communication and coordination and so we certainly um, yeah that's, that's the purpose of the upcoming coordination calls is to begin to work with them on those things okay are there any incentives for skilled nursing facilities to partake in the the three-day waiver or or more with you you as an ACO well um I think the if I were to put myself as the as the medical director or the operations leader of a skilled nursing facility, uh, the incentive that I would see is I can partner with a value based care oriented organization in in Lore Health ACO who is caring for 3,800 partnering in care of 3,800 Vermont beneficiaries. 
And to the extent that those beneficiaries, you know, if, if they get to a point where they need to have uh, additional support uh, through uh, the services I provide, that, that those beneficiaries are going to be directed to me because I, because they do not have to be admitted to the hospital for three days before that admission occurring. And so that, that would be the, op the kind of, I think the, the, the business imperative uh, and opportunity that I would see if I was a SNP operator. They then, they of course still go ahead and, and uh, submit their bills for the, for the, you know, the, the, the bed charges and all the services that they provide to CMS, just as they would uh, normally do. That's, that's all I have at this time. I'm here for my fellow colleagues. Uh, I don't have any questions myself, Member Holmes. Um, yeah, just have one, a couple, maybe two quick questions. Um, one is, you know, you do talk about a focus on health equity um, in your narrative, and and I'm wondering if you've been starting to measure or have collected any data on the uptake of these in-kind incentives by socioeconomic status. You know, any evidence that these in-kind incentives are going to have potential to close the health equity gaps? Yeah, I mean, I think I think broadly the way we we've thought through that is is really by the the partner we have um, and the the general population that uh, would receive care in FQHC may not you know full, doesn't reflect a reflects a population that may have greater socioeconomic needs than than other providers and so from that end um, one thing we we focused on is and you know we're again happy to or choose to enter into an executive session. Um, you know, we we we've, we've looked at what what are the what are areas that could be meaningful to a person to address health health equity gaps, and how do we help um, in ways that uh, the general Medicare benefit just uh, cannot or does not today. And so that's that's been how we've thought through it. Um, in terms of in terms of uptake, I think we've seen a pretty consistent uptake um, across the population. Uh, but not um, so nothing stands out in terms of you know how how we may define a lower socioeconomic status uh, beneficiary versus non. And Ms. Holmes, would I would I first of all thank you for asking that question. Um, it's it's uh, important to us. It's why we included it in the narrative. And um, it, it, we're early. You know, we're very early in terms of of being able to measure some of these things and. Um, and in fact, our the clinical team that I lead is working on you know what are the the proof points of from a health outcomes perspective that we want to be sharing in about a year's time when we have had a, a lot both more experience and more participation as well as more time to begin to actually have enough to do these types of analyses. So your question actually is timely in that um, it. it it helps us add this to what are the things that we should be looking at, and uh, uh, and so thank you for asking. Uh, well, I look forward to seeing. You know, maybe that this time next year we'll have more information on that um, as you're thinking about the design. Um, I guess my my other just question is around. You know, the narrative described no real plans for expansion in Vermont. And I'm and I'm curious as to why, to some degree. I mean, it seems like there are, you know, I'm an economist, so I'm going to say this: economies of scale uh, to achieving scale, uh, literally, or to expanding. So I'm wondering, you know, you're in four different states. Why not focus on one state and expand within one state? Yeah. So um, we would love to. Um, and in fact, we had earlier this year we had conversations with. Uh, Another uh, provider in in Vermont, as they were contemplating uh, joining an, an, an accountable care organization, and I, it would be my preference to be reporting that we've added another another partner in Vermont uh, today. So we are we're very open to speaking with anyone uh, uh, to to grow to be able to to partner with more organizations and serve them. I think I think even in terms of what I had shared in terms of our outreach to the area aging area agency on aging, as well as the SNP conversation, show, is is a an examples of our intent to work broadly within the community because that's 
that's where people you know, live, learn, work, play, pray, and that's where you know we want to be connected to the right people in all the right ways. So um, again, maybe next year I, we can report that we've had growth in that area because we certainly, in fact, even today, yesterday at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine conference where I'm at, I spoke with a uh, with a provider in Vermont who, and we actually spent 30 minutes together talking about what what Laura is, and I was curious about what she does and her type of practice. Learned a lot, and we we're going to have a follow up conversation based on that. So if you just to put the hat on of uh, one of those providers or a provider in the state of Vermont that you, what would you say would be an obstacle to joining Laura from their perspective, or what would be a barrier? Why not yeah. jump in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just I, but the one one clear just uh, to clarify really quick. So we, so that that was a change in our narrative response. Um, I think the question itself, you know, asks, do you have active plans to expand in Vermont? Um, and our, our you know, I think our response this year was we, we do not have an active campaign in Vermont, um, but we are open to partnering. So I, just to just to add additional context. So I think, yeah. Sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Yeah, no, thank thank you for that. The I think the I think the really there's there's the main barrier is time and, and like space to actually think about doing something differently. I mean, everyone's working so hard. Uh, and this is true of so many conversations we have across the country with, with potential partners. And uh, so it's time and where on the list of their most compelling priorities with this type of work and decision making process fall. And so, um, we are we are undeterred by that. We 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 have those conversations. We we stay in touch, and and we get, what we consistently get our answers like not now, but come back in six months and let's talk again. Um, and so I think it's both a reflection of of time and waiting for maybe for us to have a little more experience so that they can can see us doing the things we said we were we were, were going to do. And I think I think uh, value has been tougher for some providers to move into. I think from um, from our end, you know, we we've uh, we handle really most of the um, the administration of the ACO, right? So so from a provider perspective, I think the things that they should be considering is, you know, how difficult is it to understand the contract I'm entering into? How difficult is it? You know, what's required of me? What are the financial risks? Either is there downside risk to me? Upside risk, well, like those types of questions. And again, the broken record. Happy to to, to talk to them in the executive session. Um, you know, they, they, those are the things that from provider, and I think they should think through. Which is Mark's exact point, which is a prioritization piece. I think as QPP and additional financial sticks start entering the the fee for service program, um, I think providers will be more and more incented to actually say, okay, I need to join some kind of model uh, for my fee for service beneficiaries. And so I think from that end, um, you know, I think we're an attractive option. And Mark, will you just you've used QPP a couple uh, yeah, of times? Will you just tell them what sure. that acronym stands for? Yeah, sure. It's it's a quality payment program. So it's it's how how does CMS manage from a fee for service beneficiary perspective, um, you know, quality for for those patients. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, is the is the app, do you consider the app an in-kind incentive? It is not covered by Medicare. It is uh, beneficial for their health, uh, so so yes. Okay. Um, any questions from the healthcare advocate? Yes, good afternoon. Um, Sam Paish with the healthcare advocate. Can folks hear me? Okay. Okay, great. I um, just wanted to first thank Michelle and Russ uh, at the board for all the work uh, you guys have been doing on this. Um, first couple of questions are follow-ups um, based on your responses to written pre-hearing questions. Uh, the first one, in response to a question about whether LORE is expanding community-based provider capacity and you know avoiding duplication of existing services, you said that Quote, the ACO participant maintains relationships with access navigators and others in the community to add resources for Vermont beneficiaries to understand how better to access care. I'm curious what you mean by resources, what resources are being added for Vermont beneficiaries? 
Yeah, so right, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and thanks for that. So, so from from the, from our end, uh, we again provide to our ACOs and ACO participant um, information on where, where their patients and benefit, where their patients are getting care, and so they can now AC patient X or a lot of patients use this set of this care network, et cetera. Uh, so, in terms of resources, they now have access to a set of data that they didn't have uh, without the ACO. Um, so that's that's one. They they could have some 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 uh, information through your HIE, but um, that may be limited. Uh, I think from a uh, financial perspective, if, if, the, if the financial arrangement between us and our ACO participant is positive for that ACO participant, then they now have additional dollars to uh, to care uh, and establish infrastructure uh, on site in Vermont. So that that that's the hopefully uh, hopefully clarifies resource perspective. Yeah, thanks. That's that's helpful. I mean, I spent some time reading about lore's rewards and like the lore dollars, and it wasn't clear to me like how those could be spent. Yeah, I mean, may, is that we, related we, to yeah, the we, we, yeah. yeah, we may we yeah, we may want to yeah, that name it that I'm not sure where that was and yeah, we may talk through that separately. Okay. It was just on the website. Um, sure. um I'm wondering if if Lore believes at a high level that a central problem for patients in Vermont is that they don't know how to access care. I mean, when they, in that response, you say to add resources for Vermont's beneficiaries to understand how better to access care. Could you just elaborate on what you mean by that? Um, I don't think there's a presumption that says they don't have access care. I think the better access care is, is do I have access to my provider? And does that provider have enough? You know, are they adding are they adding providers into the uh, into their staff, or is it you know a six month wait to get uh, to get to be seen? And so, from a um, so I don't think I wouldn't read our response was not meant to indicate that. So I apologize if that's okay. if that was your if that was your takeaway. No, that's okay. It's, that's the importance of clarifying and asking. So I appreciate it. Um, another response that you gave is you said by virtue of being an ACO. Both the ACO and the, our provider partner are incentivized. This is similar to Member Holmes' question around health equity. Uh, you said there are incentivized to bridge access and care equity gaps in the population. Patients can access items and services to narrow health equity gaps. I'm I'm curious, the, but the by virtue of being an ACO element, I'm I'm wondering how you feel like by definition that means that Laura is able to bridge access and care equity gaps. Yeah, I mean that that one is actually by by statute even so and regulation. So the entire I mean the entire purpose of an ACO is to say um, you now have a set of of providers uh, uh, and and us um, that that are now accountable for both the care of of, of those beneficiaries and uh, cost so cost and utilization uh, and then also the quality of that care. So in, you know the if the ACO does not deliver both an improved quality. Um, or there is at least uh, maintain quality and then uh, reduce costs. The ACO doesn't sustain, and so um, by virtue, the entire program is meant to be make someone accountable for the set of fee for service beneficiaries that otherwise, you know, would s s simply seek care and you know, other than um, in a non-systemic way, uh, you know, wouldn't wouldn't necessarily have access to uh, the things that. Ideally, uh, any ACO participating in Vermont or elsewhere uh, is trying to do. So it, it 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 is the program. I mean that that is a value based care program. So I don't. Um, yeah, I mean I'll we'll stick by the answer. It, it, it's, okay. it is that is I mean that's the definition. That is the statutory like point of having this this law to allow entities um, to 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 help improve you know, utilization. And quality for for fee for service beneficiaries. So, I mean, that is the that is the program. Yeah, no, I understand the definition. I sure. guess for me, I would draw a distinction between what the definition of something is, and I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at is how does the value based care arrangement that you're talking about advance health equity? How does it? Because simply by by definition, being something is different than causing or you know instigating an impact on something else. Yeah, so, in my view. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, th I, I think we, we, we you, you've aligned, we've aligned incentives. And so in the case of, of any beneficiary that, that, you know, to the extent it's possible that there's, a, there's, there are equity gaps, um, 
with an ACO should, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine a, a case that with an ACO is worse than uh, without an ACO. And so I, you know, that's, that's just the view that, that you know, I think we take and in previous roles I've taken from a CMS perspective. I would, I'm just curious how you evaluate, like make that value assessment. Like how are you measuring, like defining success relative to not being in an ACO relationship? I, I may I may be missing the question, Mark. I don't know if you want to. Well, yeah. Let me let me see if I can uh, take take a swing at this. I think the so first of all the the fact that we have to think it's very important that our inter interventions work for as many people as possible, and and going all the way back several years, you know, the the initial the initial ideas were piloted with our FQH federally qualified health center partner in San Diego County because we wanted to make sure that that the approaches we were taking worked for almost everybody. So it's so the we have three federally qualified health centers in the ACO overall, and it is our intent, uh, and maybe linking to the question that Jessica asked earlier, it's our intent to understand uh, from a proof points perspective. Uh, we want to prove that this does work for as many people as possible in all circumstances that they face. And so, um, the fact that we have additional, just as one example, the fact that we have additional information about how Vermont Medicare beneficiaries are accessing acute care services, to be able to get on the phone then with the leadership team at North Star and say, hey, let's look at our list of beneficiaries um, who have been in the emergency department three or more times. Um, we, we actually do that, you know, from my perspective, it's like we're, we want to reach out to every one of those people. So, to the, so I guess Sam, uh, our my assumption is there is we're reaching out to to a, a, the broad swath of, of Vermonters who are on fee for service Medicare, and we're going to help them uh, with with their clinical team partners identify the things that are leading them to end up in the ER as often as they are, and. Uh, and we want to fix that for them. So we will, um, you know, based on the data that we have access to that we receive, we will, you know, we will get reach a point where we've done this for long enough and we've had enough experiences where we can begin to look at it from uh, any number of demographic factors to understand if there is a disparity in results that we're seeing. And then we can have a conversation about why do we think that's happening and, and frankly include of the Medicare beneficiary in that conversation um, so that we have their perspective as well. Is that, does that help a little bit? Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to put up the redacted appendices because I just had a kind of high level question about the changes in financial performance. Yeah, I, between the, so we've submitted, yeah. we've actually submitted another, I mean, I. I'm not sure, Michelle or Russ, how you, you'd like to handle that. Um, cause we, we've actually submitted a second request based on further information we've understood process wise. I'll just so note I, that, um, we pulled down the original redacted version you sent us when you sent us the new confidentiality request. So we will need to receive an updated redacted version of that so we can repost that to the website. Sure. I may have an executive session questions, but I'm here. It, it, it may be if the board chooses. Okay. I don't All exactly. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Sam, is there a way to ask it without executive session, or do you need executive session to ask the question? I mean, I'd love to ask it in the public session. I mean, I, the request just came in recently, so I, I mean, I, I'm i not a lawyer. I'm not at liberty to really opine on whether or not it's fair game. I mean, I, 
I was mostly curious about changes what, what, at a what's high level. The, yeah, we, yeah. We, we can maybe, we can, so if you have like a broad, like the broad question is why would our projections change over time? Um, we can we can answer that and see if that meets your, your question probably. So um, so certainly we submitted a, a budget last year to the, to the board. Um, you know, we we submitted also a, a re uh, resubmission in March, April of this year, just based on initial uptake. Um, so we now have actual experience, and so I think what um, you know, we we're able to see how many you know how many patients are able uh, to, act, to actually to, to join Lore, uh, how many patients are are utilizing uh, different parts of us uh, and, and what we offer, um, and so I think from uh, from that end, we're you know we're actually we're we're now giving you projections based off of real world experience, um, and and so that's when you see. We see what's what's changed uh, in our submission. It's it really is a uh, it's just a reflection of we gave you our best guess last year um, based on our experience, uh, and we hadn't implemented. Uh, we began implementing uh, really January of this year, and we've seen uh, we've we've learned from that. And so I think from our end, where um, where we're really encouraged is uh, I think our partners now um, you know they 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 they've developed momentum. Uh, and so that you know, they, their providers understand what what the ACO is. They understand what the program is, and what additional in kind incentives available to their patients are. And so now they're they're able to have those conversations. Um, and we're seeing really uh, what we hoped for, which is um, you know a pretty substantial increase in, in you know patient engagement and uptake. So I think from that end, um, we're we're encouraged there. And so I think what what you see in um, you know the, the broad submission is. Is our 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 assumptions around, you know, what uh, what we think are better assumptions, uh, based on based on our current directories of of what twenty twenty four should look like. So I I think from that end, um, you know, we're we're still uh, that's what we're tracking to. But I don't know if that's sufficient. And Mark, feel free to add from behind, please. Okay, um, I have a. I had a couple of questions. The last thing about um, beneficiaries access to the platform and whether or not you track that. Would Laura prefer to answer that in public, or is that more of an executive session question? Uh, we do not track that. We track uh, every beneficiary has a choice um, to join Laura, uh, so that's that's their choice. So. We we the, the the parts that we track are who's actually joined, um, and then from that end, uh, it's their it's their choice, it's their preference that they choose to, they choose both to join and they, they choose to continue to find value in in, um, in working through uh, different parts of their health, uh, in part with us, in part with their providers. Okay, is do you feel like the app is the primary mechanism by which? Laura hopes to, you know, make inroads, improvements in quality, health outcomes, that sort of thing. Is that like a major vehicle, or is that, you know, just a part of the care model? Yeah, I think I think we meet people where they are. So if, if they're able to um, engage in the app and, and and join a community of people, uh, that's certainly our our preferred path. Um, they still keep their relationship with their providers, and that's standard. And so we hope that that uh, is enriched, um, and we really are just sitting beside that. I think for people that are, um, you know, non-digital, uh, their digital health literacy may be, um, or the access may be limited uh, to, to, to non-existent. We have uh, accommodation and accessibility pathways that we work with them on, and so I think from that end, um, you know, our general view is that uh, people that are Thinking about how their decisions and how their um, uh, and learning about how their their health and is, is impacted from diet, exercise, sleep, uh, go down the list, uh, stress. I think the question you know, commonly is, is childhood trauma and how that impacts over time someone's health. Um, so we look at that as you know broad chronic or systemic inflammation that has sequelae and disease. I think all of that um, is a focus of the the broad approach that we take, and I think that. The the way the the medium that, that that's affected by or affected in um, is a combination. Sometimes people will join the digital community. Sometimes people will do that um, 
you know, in a non-digital way that uh, is more them uh, and reflections on their own uh, engagement with, with the things that we we help provide them. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. Appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. I'll open it up to public comment via the raise the hand function. Walter, did you have anything? I saw you appear here. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Owen. Yeah, you've got me pegged. <laughs> uh, most of my questions, the board has, the board and Sam have already asked, but I was concerned about a couple things with this lore health. Are you, one of them is transparency. Uh, are you or are you not a direct contracting agency, a private equity firm? Second to that is exactly where are you headquartered? And this picks up off of Jessica's question. Third, is there can, a can way- we, can, we, can, we, can, we, can we by chance answer each question? Just I won't remember them. I want to make sure we answer each. Is that okay, we Mr. Carpenter? You, Mark. <laughs> uh, okay. Go for it. I think your first um, question is if, oh, sorry. Where are you headquartered? So the ACO is headquartered uh, in California, San Diego. I saw a list on the web that said you were in Hong Kong. Um, we who are, we are not in Hong Kong. <laughs> so that was Gather so, Health, which is formerly your parent. Um, there, who are your there investors? May be, yeah. You know, so just let to, me just to... let me sorry let me inter let me interrupt um let me let me do it this way um Walter why don't you go ahead with any comments or questions you may have and then I'll see if there's any that I want to pass along um to to the folks from Laura okay. yeah that might work a little better and when we say transparency profit and loss statements um what are the CEOs compensated. Um, <clears throat> because this is obviously a managed care type thing, for lack of a better phrase right now. Do you or do you not deny claims? And I ask this too because my Medicare prices are almost doubling next year. Um, <clears throat> And when you say beneficiaries, I wonder if we really are a beneficiary because we're being forced by the federal government to pay this. And this is another middle person within the doctor patient Medicare relationship. So I'll leave it to Owen. <laughs> but the transparency is as a patient. The transparency is the one I'm looking at. Can I maybe answer one question, Chair Foster, and then just to Please. clarify? Go ahead. So, yeah, Mr. Carpenter. So just just to just to orient this, so we are not a managed care organization. So so that that would be in the term, in context of Medicare, um, uh, generally what, what's called the Medicare Advantage Plan. So we we are not a Medicare Advantage Plan. And so, um, go ahead. So, so we we do not have the ability to deny claims. We, we don't have the ability. There's no network. So you, uh, a, a per, someone who, who is entitled to Medicare, they're a beneficiary of Medicare, uh, has the option every year to choose the, a, a private plan administered through Medicare Advantage. They have the option to remain in fee for service. We're, we're we are not a, a middle. We're not in the middle there at all. We're, we're, the middle there is assumably you have a relationship with your provider. We partner with providers. Um, you know broadly and then uh uh and then if, if, if you're a patient of that that provider and that's who you receive your primary care services from we can only uh, do things that are additive to to try to help you um you know be healthier uh but you can choose not to engage with them. you can still maintain your relationship with your provider but we don't medicare is your is your coverage if you if you're in fever service which it sounds like you might be as so of your fever service if you're if you're Part B premium is going up. Um, that's in regards to just general cost inflation in healthcare. And I think the 
broadly, the, the Green Mountain Care Board is, is trying its best to address inflation in Vermont, but sometimes there are things that are federally uh, based in terms of, of, of price increases uh, from actuaries. So new drugs that come out, so Alzheimer's medica medications, for example, you know, drive up premiums. So those are things that aren't controlled by us and certainly aren't controlled uh, by the Green Mountain Care Board. I don't know if that, that helps. Just to clarify the record, if there's a Hong Kong-based Gather Health, we wish them all the luck, but that's not our parent organization and that's not us in any way. So we, um, that's that. And, and, you know, we certainly uh, wish to be as transparent as we can be. Um, certainly with questions like this, we're happy to be transparent, but we're, uh, you know, we are uh, in a competitive space. And so we, we want to make sure that we sustain. And so whenever you hear us ask, answer a question, um, we're trying to make sure that uh, things that we are building, uh, we can build on and actually have, a, a you know, hopefully a successful uh, organization over time. We are not a direct contracting entity. I think your your question there, uh, we are part of, again, the, the shared savings program for Medicare. Um, but Chair Foster, I yield back to you. No, that, was, that was really helpful. And I hope that addresses your questions, Walter. Uh, we, and if I recall correctly, we had a fairly extensive executive session last year around some of these topics, right? Right. Yeah, I thought that was um, that was helpful. Um, and I think that our attorney had found the information on that was confidential, which is why we had the executive uh, session is competitively sensitive. Um, any other public comment at this time? Okay, great. Um, Michelle, can you remind me the schedule of when we next have Laura on our agenda? I think you said it in the beginning, but I, I forgot just for folks on the call here today. Is it December? Sure. We have a staff presentation on Monday, November 20th, and a potential vote on Wednesday, December 6th. Next, right. Okay, great. Um, okay, well, uh, Dr. Bryce Hicker and Mr. Atala, nice to see you, and thank you for your presentation and your answers and your submission. Thank, thank you. Um, it's good to see all of you again, and uh, we will watch for any follow-ups from, from the board. So thank you very much. Great. And we certainly owe you, Michelle, a few updates and we'll we'll follow up. Thank, thank you all. We appreciate the time. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, is there any new or old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And thank you very much, Mr. McCracken and Ms. Sawyer. Have a good day, everyone.